So picking up what we were talking about on strategy, so the thing about in terms of marketing focus, when we think about strategy, it's understanding the landscape, figuring out who's the most uh, relevant competitors, and predict. And we have to predict what they're going to do. Uh, the thing about when you make goals, goals need to be smart. And what we mean by smart is specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. Unless you make goals that can fit the kind of definition, you're, you're just making a nebulous plan. And so the thing is, you can't make it, you know, specific. We're going to be better than Google. Uh, okay, but how are you going to be better than Google? How are you going to measure it? Is it attainable for the technology that you have to be better than Google? Uh, and the goals that you pick, are they relevant? And also, how much time are you going to take? Um, you have to think about what you're good at, whether it's operational excellence, product leadership, or customer intimacy. And the thing is, when you measure where, how you do in a market, you're looking at whether or not you're focusing on horizontal or vertical markets. And horizontal markets are basically general markets, like cars. And a vertical market is something very specific, like an SUV uh, market. And so what it comes down to is you could be a price leader, a differentiated leader, which pretty much means you're the best product, or a segmentation strategy, and that has to do with niches and all. Uh, you can do more than one. You could be a price leader and do segmentation strategy at the same time. These all can overlap. Uh, the thing is, when you think about Orbit versus Priceline versus Expedia, eh, none of them stand out. They don't differentiate well. And that's why you kind of think of them as commoditized businesses. Uh, the thing is, with startups, you don't have a lot of resources, and the incumbents do. Uh, the thing is, traditional theory has always said you pick one market to enter and whatever. But the thing is with digital, it's just so cheap to create more channels. It's okay to have more channels. Uh, and also, uh, the old theory is that you can only compete in one of those three spaces. But now, nah, because of technology, you can compete more than one. So in terms of the strategic landscape, what you're concerned about are these five factors where buyer power is, what if a bunch of buyers get together and decide they want to purchase something? For example, when ASU purchases insurance for its employees, get all the employees together. Supplier power is that basically the suppliers have the power because there's just only so many places you can purchase it so they all get together. OPEC is supplier power. Uh, we've talked about substitution and lock-in and lock-out. Lock-in is how my strategy to keep you with my company and not wander off. Lockout is I'm going to protect my com companies, again, uh, my ugh, customers from anything on the outside. Uh, the thing about static and dynamic markets is static markets are they're <laughs> static for a reason. They don't change a lot. And that's where, like, medical, for example, is a very static business. It changes very slowly. And so typically when you see static markets, it's either because it's dying or there's a lot of regulation uh, in it. And the thing is regulation in itself uh, creates barriers to entry. Uh, the thing about digital technology, though, is that it's disrupted a lot of markets. And that's because it's so cheap to create. Uh, this is probably the most important thing that you need to understand about competition. Competition is taken from the viewpoint of the customer. Competition can take place at very different levels. When a typical company thinks about competition, they think about somebody who does exactly the same thing I do. Like if I'm Delta, my competition is United. Uh, the thing is, I could, uh, if the distance is very short, my competition is, I might as well just drive. Just because security at the airport is so damn long. And I've done that before. It's like I only have a 45 minute flight, but I'm thinking, oh my God, I got to get to the airport two hours early and all. And I'm just going to take my car. Um, the thing about uh, competitors 
and direct competitors are basically enterprises that vie with you over the same customer values. The question is, how do you touch the customer and who actually touches the customer? And this is where perceptual maps and value chains. So when we talk about, okay, so we want to think about competition and we want to think about enterprises that do the same thing that we do. This is what a perceptual map is. What you do is you pick a couple of values. So in this case, I'm opening a fast food burger joint. And so I'm concerned about price and I'm concerned about speed. And I'm going to create a new uh, company called Burger Dial where you order, sell, uh, your order on your cell phone and by the time you get to the drive-up window it's already waiting for you there. You don't even have to pay because you're doing it by phone and everything else. One thing that's really interesting about these uh, quadrants is look up here. In terms of expensive and fast, there's nobody competing in that space. And that's because nobody can make a fast hamburger and still have it be really high quality. Um, so the thing is, what you do is, uh, the process of making that is pick the two most important values, put it, divide it into four quadrants, and then just start placing who you think the competitors are. Uh, you don't have to be scared by competition, but, what, but the, the thing that it does is it makes you aware of who, uh, what you're going against, but then you need a strategy to outfight them. Uh, the thing is, you can do more than two dimensions. You could do perceptual maps within perceptual maps within perceptual maps. When we get to positioning maps, you'll find out people make maps based on like 15 different dim uh, dimensions. Uh, another approach of doing uh, uh, mapping out your competition is just by table tabulation. And that's that you look at all the parameters, and it could be more than two, um, <coughs> that companies are judged by, and then you f figure out who they all are and how they compare against you. I mean, when you've looked at purchasing uh, products, you know, they put them side by side. Uh, in terms of competitive scope, those closest to you are direct. They uh, do what you do. Minor is they're indirect. They do offer the same service, but it's not their main focus of business. Like if I want a hamburger, uh, a diner is competition for McDonald's. Uh, but they do different things, so that's why they're indirect. And potential competitors are those who um, are on the horizon. And so you always should be aware of uh, uh, where they are. Uh, I am not going to go through Prisoner's Dilemma because it's going to take a lot of time. Um, but where Prisoner's Dilemma is useful, and you can read the example, if you have any questions, let me know. But you have two people, and they're both captured, and they have certain penalties. And so the question is, should they snitch on each other, or should they be silent? And what it comes down to is that you have to map out the strategies, and when you do, you can figure out what the best return is. So, for example, if I'm Matt uh, and David decides to stay silent, uh, if David stays silent and I snitch on him, then what happens is I get zero years. If I stay silent and he stays silent, then I get one year. So the best thing for me to do if David stays silent is to do nothing. I mean, it's to snitch on him. Now, what if David snitches? If he snitches, we both get five years. But if I stay silent and he snitches, I get 10 years. So again, um, the best thing for me to do is snitch. And so the proper strategy for both of them is they should snitch on each other. Um, and this is called the dominant strategy, that it works in every case. And John Forbes Nash, for those of you who saw the movie A Beautiful Mind, came up with this theory, and it was actually his doctoral dissertation. Holy cow, his doctoral dissertation was like 15 pages long. Um, the thing about when you evaluate your competition, you do a competitor profile. You look at their strategy, their capability, and what their goals are. And so the sub uh, variables are shown for you. And this is the factors you do. So if somebody tells you, I want a, comp a competitive assessment, I want a competitor profile, this is what they're asking about. 
assessing your competition. You also look at the value chain. And because you want to see what are the types of things that they do compared to the types of things that you do. And that's why the diner is significantly different than what the things that a McDonald's does. Uh, you mine for information, uh, whether you can actually pay for reports that give you information, but you know, you've got the web and everything else. Uh, the thing about uh, competition is you can pretty much sum it up as competition uh, can be looked at through the five C's, Porter's five forces. Uh, some people use SWOT analysis. I, I don't like SWOT analysis. And that's where you basically outline comparing you to your competition, your strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. The reason why I don't like SWOT analysis is that it doesn't give any weighting. Like for example, what you have a great strength and a weight weakness. What wins out? Yeah, it doesn't help you. The model doesn't help you at all. Um, we're going to break here for the next video.